We also know that mental health clearly plays a big role when it comes to suicide risk. Psychological autopsy and other research methodologies show time and time again that more than nine out of 10 cases where a person has died by suicide, there was a mental illness at play, whether or not it was diagnosed or in treatment. In fact, the majority of the time, unfortunately, it's not. It's only 40% of the cases of suicide where those individuals were in treatment. Among those mental health conditions that rise to the top to create that risk for suicide, mood disorders, both unipolar depression and bipolar disorder, substance use disorders, also very important and oftentimes comorbid with mood disorders, psychotic disorders turn out to have a very high risk for suicide, personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder, and anxiety and PTSD. And comorbidity is more the rule rather than the exception. Um, to increase risk. But if you think about it, most people with mental illness in your clinical practice and that you know are, are not suicidal and do not die by suicide. Now, ideation is very different, and we'll get there when we get to um, the clinical pearls part. A lot of people can have suicidal ideation. It's what happens next, and it's what they do with that, it's how they interpret it. And it's if their cognition starts to narrow in on that being the solution for the pain that they're in. So most people with mental illness do not die by suicide. Now you could say, well, that has to do with the severity of illness, and it could, that's certainly a big part of it. But there clearly are other factors in the mix, so that your part is absolutely to pay attention to their mental health condition. But the more that you can understand what are those other factors that come to bear, um, that can be part of the treatment that you offer them. We also know that three in 10 people who have taken their lives have had a high blood alcohol level. So drugs and alcohol have a big role to play when it comes to suicide, even if that person does not have a substance use disorder. We also know that better depression care can save lives. There are a number of studies that are really cool. Um, one in particular, we, um, this was an AFSP-funded study that trained primary care physicians in a part of Hungary that has one of the highest suicide rates in the world and found that just by teaching them how to do really good depression care, they drove down the suicide rate for that region over the course of the years that that training was in place. When the, unfortunately, when the training was removed, then the suicide rates um, went back to closer to what they were. We know that means matter, and what we mean by that is that having quick, ready access to lethal means has very much to do with one's suicide risk. And we're not just talking about firearms, although we are because we're, we are including them because they're such a common um, form of a, a method for suicide. But what the research shows is that for every type of lethal means, from building bridge barriers to access to firearms and different firearm policies that have changed, for example, in the Israeli military, they had to put their firearm away for the weekend and store it before they went home to their families. Um, blister packaging of medications, the UK coal gas story, pesticide poisoning in Asia and efforts there to reduce access to pesticides. Every single research study points to the same result, which is that when you limit access to lethal means, you drive down the suicide rate for that entire region. And that really kind of busts the myth that people who are bent on suicide will find a way, because part of the reason for that is probably that there's timing is involved here. The intensity for the suicidal urge is short, on the order of minutes to hours in some cases. But if the person can live through that, those, those moments in time, there's a very good chance that they will not go on to find a different uh, method for suicide. The timing in a person's life also matters. So transitions in our lives, while sometimes they're exciting, sometimes they're negatively stressful, they are vulnerable times, particularly for people who are coming out, being discharged of an inpatient psychiatric unit or out of the emergency department for suicidality. Those discharge periods are some of the high-risk periods for people with, um, with mood disorders and other psychiatric conditions who are at risk for suicide. That is the time when we need to be the most careful, and it is the time, unfortunately, when a lot of slipping through the cracks happens in our healthcare system. It's also the case for military personnel who are being discharged from active duty service. That period also is showing up to be a very high-risk time for suicide. Another thing 
Ambivalence is the ti- there's a timing to ambivalence. It's very dynamic. This is talking about your patient's sense of that ratio of desire to live versus desire to die. And, and I don't know about you, but in my own clinical practice, before I became very focused on suicide, I was not, I was not in the thick of it as much as now that I know that I need to be that if you are not afraid to go there and engage your patients in those conversations about what is it in this current instance of suicide thinking or recent attempt that drove you there, and and slow down your pace with them if you can. If you can't, then try to follow up with them closely to have the conversation to allow them to tell you the story, the narrative of how they got there in the first place. There are treatments that I'm going to tell you about that hone in on that. They are very suicide specific. Engage the patient as the driver of treatment along with you, and um, are showing great results. Clinicians do matter when it comes to suicide. So, 30 to 40 percent of people who take their lives have told a clinician, whether it's a doctor or a therapist, emergency room um, or primary care. I've been alluding to these suicide-specific treatments that are growing in number and in their evidence. And, um, you know, I think about the fact that, like I just mentioned to you, I was not employing that kind of care, even though I was somebody who was passionate about suicide and was doing suicide prevention for my own colleagues and so forth. We do need to know more. And, and I shouldn't have had to work so hard to pull all this information together when I got to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It was not readily available in the world. But part of the reason also is because some of this is actually very new information. The science is evolving quite rapidly. Um, and so it, the time is now, but, um, and, and we are gathered, so it's, it's terrific. Now, the other thing I want to mention about clinicians' role in this is that we've had, I think historically, sort of an over-reliance on just asking our patient if they're having suicidal thoughts, maybe intent, maybe plan, and then that's it. And we kind of stop there. And if you never do an overall suicide risk assessment, either on intake or at some point in time when their, when their health status changes um, with their condition, some clinicians recommend doing it on a regular basis. The suicide risk assessment is a much better way. And it's cer- it, so here's the good news. Good clinical care for suicide risk is one and the same with good care for yourself medical legally. So if you learn how to do the suicide risk assessment and what action steps to take following that and you document that, that's going to be the best care and that's going to be protection for you as well.